In recent years, mental health has been pushed towards the forefront of public and national conversations on our overall health. Joining me to discuss mental health in the Black community and race-based stress is psychologist at Montefiore Medical Center and assistant professor at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, Dr. Ryan DeLapp. Doctor, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Now, I just want to jump right into it. Why should mental health and wellness for Black communities require a nuanced approach? Uh, it's a great question. I mean, I think within the Black community, there's such a, a beautiful, rich um, uh, history that goes along with the, that experience. And then there's also unique experiences that Black individuals have to navigate every single day. And so taking a one size fit all, fits all approach to mental health care might miss some of these unique qualities and also not allow the individual, the black individual to feel like their whole self can truly be represented within uh, the mental health space. And so uh, I, I really think that wellness and any type of mental health care really needs to um, uh, be able to respect that nuance. Now, in the past, you've done research on racial stress. Can you explain what racial stress is and how it impacts mental health? Yeah, I've been very fortunate to have the opportunity to talk with many uh, Black individuals and individuals of color about racial stress. And I think it really breaks down to this. It's how someone's unique daily experiences or lived experiences are influenced simply because of how they present to the world around them. And racial stress can come in the forms of internal experiences in terms of how one uh, relates to themselves or their own identities or their own race. And then also how they estimate that the world is going to respond to that. And then also externally, we as individuals have to monitor or be confronted with how race is discussed in the media. It's also discussed um, or presented in different systems such as housing, education, policing, and so all of these things can exert some form of stress on the individual in some way. Can you actually detail what some of these unique stresses are, just so people can have a, a visualization of like what different communities are experiencing? Yeah, so all the way down to your day to day. So whether it's work and you step into a workspace and, you know, you overhear a colleague um, saying something that they may uh, have heard or read online that's about the black community that is not really how you see yourself. It, uh, it creates a stress in terms of how that feels and how do you navigate that situation. Um, and what we call that in kind of research is microaggressions or these kind of subtle day-to-day -day experiences that someone has to deal with either at work, at school, um, in their transportation, that really they aren't really sure whether it's due to race or some other type of aspect of themselves, but it definitely causes an emotional discomfort or some sort of conflict. And so that's on the more kind of subtle level. But then also there can be more, I guess, clear cut racial stresses, whether it's watch what you when you see police, police brutality on TV and you see a differential treatment between uh, someone who presents as black, but um, maybe less harsh treatment of someone who is not black presenting or who is maybe white presenting. Those uh, experiences, those images tend to live rent free in our minds and can sometimes cause some emotional discomfort. So when you brought up microaggressions, it made me think about a lot of things. And I also want to kind of put the spotlight on younger communities or younger people within these communities, because although when we think about mental health and stress, we think about adults, but children also go through this as well. Can you quickly talk about that as well? Yes, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. And that's actually some of the work that I've uh, had a great opportunity of doing here at Montefiore is figuring out how do we have conversations with kids about race? And then how do we help them to grow and develop as uh, their identities and feeling a sense of pride in who they are? But then also, how do we help them to prepare for a world where they may go out and people may treat them or see them in ways that they don't see themselves? And so uh, I think microaggressions within younger uh, youth and, and, and racism within younger youth can have a, a number of different effects. Um, and it's not just kind of at Montefiore these conversations are starting. These conversations start within the homes. They start within families. This is something that's been going on for years within Black culture. And it's it's been a pleasure of mine to be a part of an institution like Montefiore where I can come alongside families and, and join them in those conversations. 
So I'm really glad that you brought up families because I wanted to talk about uh, generational structures. Now, for a very long time, I think kids today are so lucky that they have these outlets. For a very long time, it was not as encouraged to talk about mental health or some of these things within um, some communities, some African-American communities. Can you just explain why, you know, oftentimes we avoided these conversations about mental health? Yeah, that's a that's a big question and and a really important one. I think uh, one of the beautiful things about the black family is it's uh, from uh, the elders of those families all the way down to the uh, younger individuals. Like the elders are are trying to coach or help younger you younger individuals navigate the world that of racial stress that maybe they were raised in. And and some of the things, unfortunately, within mental health care and other forms of like care in general, um, there has just been some really unfortunate experiences that black individuals have had in these spaces. It's created what we call a sense of cultural mistrust in the system um, and in just, you know, providers in, into whether providers can actually uh, help. I think also within the black community, there have been other forms of support that have been normalized like the church or other forms of spirituality that really have been sanctioned as that's where you go and seek your support from. And I think it's it's important for us as a community of mental health providers to respect these other these unique experiences and these other forms of healing to try to join with kind of some of these generational experiences to adapt our healthcare to be more um, acceptable to whatever the generational kind of age is of the black individual seeking care. Now, I also want to touch on the stigma attached to mental health issues. I think for a very long time, um, there was just negativity attached to it or or people would think a certain way about a, an individual who came out and talked about their mental health. Do you think we've moved past that or do you feel as a society we struggle with talking about mental health? Um, I think uh, it's a little bit of both. I think we have grown significantly in terms of the stigma towards seeking help uh, from a mental health provider. You know, I think about um, some of the more recent public figures such as Simone Biles in the Summer Olympics and uh, NBA players and other kind of black athletes and even athletes that, who are not black who, you know, publish certain stories in like the Players' Tribune about their own personal experiences of mental health. So I see, I think we see from like some of the public figures that you know, the black community looks up to, uh, that we're seeing that mental health is uh, talked about and there's an openness to it. However, however, I do think on the other side of that, there is still a stigma. There still is a reluctance to be open and to talk with a mental health provider. And, and one of the big barriers is, is uh, you know, sometimes there's not, a, there's not a lot of providers who may look like you, who may have a shared background or shared experience, right? So then you're, you're taking what you talk about at home or what you experience in a private space and then you're going to go try to talk to somebody who doesn't look like you that may create a big challenge. Right. Um, and so I, I think there are, I think we've grown and we still have a ways to go. I'm so happy that you brought that up because I wanted to know, do you feel that it's important that we find, you know, a therapist or someone to help us that shares a similar background to us? Do you think that's important or something that we should check off? Um, and how do we know if someone is the right match? Uh, I will say, it, it, yes, it's important, and, but it's not a necessity in order for mental health care to be beneficial. Um, I say it's important because I speak from personal experience and the people I've had the opportunity to work with. There is just something about sitting across from somebody who looks like you, who you just trust might have a similar understanding of what your day-to-day -day experience may go like. And there's an ease that comes with that shared experience. However, unfortunately, as I've mentioned before, there's a lack of providers of, of, of black backgrounds or of minority backgrounds within this space. So to make that a, a requirement in order for you to seek mental health care, um, unfortunately may not be realistic in the current state of our, of our field right now. And so I think some of the other things that you may look for is, you know, um, how can you, well, I think another way of thinking about it is how can you be an informed consumer of mental health care? How can you come with certain questions or expectations of your provider so that whenever you come into that space, you can really tell them what you're looking for, right? And so I think that's really kind of, uh, if you can't find somebody who has a shared background, it's important to go in asking re those really important questions. 
So we have a little bit of time left. I, I really want to talk about um, ensuring that Black communities have access to these resources. You know, what do you say to that? Um, Because I know a lot of the time people think money might be an issue or there may be something else. How do we ensure that these communities have access to address any issues with mental health? Well, I I think uh, the, the first thing that comes to mind is we as a field have to continue to grow how we uh, align and work with different community organizations to make these types of resources more accessible. And for example, in Montefiore, some of the ways that that has happened is by integrating mental health care within primary care clinics. So when kids or uh, individuals go to their pediatricians or their general practitioners, there, there are mental health providers at many of the Montefiore clinics so that there isn't this big jump between, you know, somebody saying you might need a mental health provider and then you have to go search by yourself. Uh, another way for in the kid world, which is where I operate a lot working with youth, is also schools and finding ways to collaborate there. And Montefiore also has a lot of school-based clinics to also reduce that type of uh, disparity as well. Uh, But I think the field still has a lot more room for growth in terms of making sure that insurances, uh, you know, reimburse um, to providers uh, in a way that makes providers interested in being on insurance panels, which is a little bit more of a systemic issue. But I think really trying to find ways to align with community agencies uh, schools, primary care offices, even faith-based organizations will really make sure that these resources are more accessible. And what can people do to further educate themselves about prioritizing mental health? And what advice would you have to make sure somebody uh, really prioritizes their own mental health? Yes. So prioritizing your own mental health, I think, it can mean a number of different things. Um, I think really it's trying to start with the daily reflection of of kind of what your your experience is. I talked to all my patients about this this acronym called BEAT, like what's your BEAT? And that's paying attention to your body sensations, paying attention to your emotions, paying attention to your actions and your urges, and paying attention to your thoughts. And really incorporating that kind of exercise into your day-to-day life and really trying to ask yourself, you know, as I notice what's on my BEAT, am I aligning that with the values that I have for myself? Now, sometimes you can do that alone or sometimes it's helpful to do that with a provider. Uh, So I think prioritizing mental health can come with doing something simple as that. If you're trying to educate yourself, I think using social media, there are a lot of wonderful resources out there uh, of of providers who are trying to educate folks about uh, mental health. One uh, podcast slash social media um, uh, outlet that I think folks can really tune into is Our Mental Health Minute, uh, which is sponsored by some of my colleagues, Dr. Sean Jones and um, Rihanna, Rihanna Anderson. And they really focus on the intersection of mental health and the black community in these like short one to two minute clips. They like, just talk about different concepts. And I think it could be a really good place to start. Doctor, thank you so much for joining me to talk about this. On the screen, you will see their social media so you can stay up to date with them and what they're doing and learn more about the resources available. And once again, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. That's all for our show today. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Kim Nalene, wishing you and your safety and wellness now and always. See you next time.